In this video, I'm going to talk about a phenomenon that the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung called the most marvelous of all psychological laws. It's an idea that's been passed down for at least a thousand years, but people seem to have forgotten about it. But maybe it's still there, lurking right under the surface of your conscious awareness, and you needed to hear it put into words and shaped into a narrative again. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do, dear listener. So sit back and relax as we journey into the heart of the ancient law of opposites. There was once a young man whose college life was completely chaotic. His bed was dirty enough to be a health hazard and his academic life was a dumpster fire. But after graduation, he went through a sudden and strange transformation. Something just clicked in him and he became super organized. In fact, every aspect of his life became systematic and well planned. But after his transformation, he also developed a critical attitude towards anyone who did not meet his standards of organization. His personal and professional relationships often became strained by his intolerance for even the slightest sloppiness in others. For all his high standards though, there was a shame he carried in secret. Once in a while, he experienced episodic bouts of intense but short-lived disorganization. During these periods, his old college habits would resurface, but he meticulously hid these lapses from the world, fearing judgment and the shattering of the image he had worked so hard to build. Now, I don't think I mentioned this young man's roommate from back in the day. His roommate was super type A and obsessed with structure and academic achievement. But when he finally got the dream job in finance he worked so hard for since he was a kid, something cracks in him. His self-discipline falls apart and he stops seeing the point of working in a job he doesn't enjoy. So he gives up the corporate rat race, upends his previous life and moves to the mountains. Most of the time he feels satisfied with his decision. But once in a while he stays awake in bed feeling something akin to regret ruminating about what his other life could have been. Such is the way of Enantiodromia. Now think of a country called Apollonia that was once celebrated for its liberal and progressive values. It used to be a beacon of artistic freedom and social tolerance. But over the last decade, a shift occurred. Liberal attitudes became widely perceived as excesses and as threats to social cohesion and this led to Apollonia's steady transformation into a rigid traditional and punitive society. In contemporary Apollonia the once celebrated freedoms are now heavily suppressed. Citizens take pride in posting on social media about how upstanding, rule-abiding and morally pure they are. But if you had a sneak peek into most of their internet search histories, well, you would know that they're not doing a very good job of meeting their self-imposed standards of purity if you know what i mean the younger citizens dream of escaping the iron cage apollonia has become right across from apollonia lies dionysia a small country which has been under the grip of a rigid military dictatorship for over a century people used to live under an iron fist of tradition and order but now finally the regime has crumbled the streets which were once silent burst with life and the air is filled with beautiful heartfelt expressions of liberty murals of hope and liberation color the city yet as time unfolds the air of freedom starts feeling a bit off the celebrations slowly morph into the ruckus noise of aimless debauchery with an ominous feeling that depravity is just right around the corner young citizens start meeting in secret to discuss how to restore dionysia to its former glory such is the way of an anchodromia Okay, that's enough with the vivid cross-culturally applicable examples and mysterious phrasing and stuff, yeah. So just tell me, what is enantiodromia? Cool. So enantiodromia is an ancient principle which was adapted by the psychoanalyst Carl Jung to describe the tendency of one psychological extreme to turn into its opposite extreme over time. 
It comes from the ancient Greek words enantio, meaning in the other direction, and dromia, meaning to run. Taken together, enantio dromia literally means running in the opposite direction. So extreme orderliness has the potential to turn into extreme disorderliness. Extremely traditional attitudes pave the way for the emergence of countercultural revolutions. Extreme religiosity might turn into deadening nihilism and then unshakable conviction in political ideologies. And vice versa for all the above. The Enantiodromia principle challenges a clear linear perspective of development and change. Instead, you see a cyclical pattern emerging where every psychological tendency contains the seed of its reverse psychological tendency. The moment of reversal usually comes when one psychological extreme is reached or at least subconsciously perceived to have been reached and then the extreme tendency reverses, sometimes rapidly into its opposite. And this goes on and on, moving the psychological system System towards equilibrium. There are many ancient echoes supporting the idea of a law of opposites, including the karmic law of action and reaction in Indic religions and the interplay of yin and yang in ancient Chinese wisdom literature. Jung was very much alive to these texts and they played a significant role in his conceptualization of enantiodromia. Among thinkers who are a bit closer in time to him, Jung's formulation of enantiodromia would also draw inspirations from and parallels with the dialectical ideas of Kant and Hegel. But the two greatest influences on the development of the Jungian idea of enantiodromia were Heraclitus and Friedrich Nietzsche. Heraclitus was an ancient Greek philosopher who lived around 500 BCE in Ephesus, a city in modern-day Turkey. He liked to speak in riddles. In fact, he was known even back in those days as Heraclitus the Obscure. You might have heard the phrase, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. That's from Heraclitus. Well, sort of. In fact, the closest translation of that idea, and one that will give you a better sense of his enthusiasm for paradoxes, is this. Just as the river where I step is not the same, and is, so I am as I am not. Don't worry, we'll come back to this. You might have also heard the idea that change is the only constant. Well, that's also derived from a Heraclitian principle that everything is in a state of flux. Everything flows, so to speak. While the flux principle itself is well known today, judging by the number of management consultants who use the change the only constant quote on their LinkedIn bios, the most important aspect of Heraclitus' idea has sadly been obscured by time. The most important aspect is this. Everything flows, but the flow is not random. Everything flows in an oppositional and cyclical way. This is what he says. By cosmic rule, as day yields night, so winter, summer, war, peace, plenty, famine, all things change. For Heraclitus, a phenomenon continually transforms into its opposite, and when it reaches this opposite state, it begins to reverse again towards the new opposite, which is the place where it started. This cyclical movement between potential poles goes on and on, but the phenomenon's core essence remains unchanged. That's why he says the really important part of the river quote that people tend to omit. Just as the river where I step is not the same, and is, meaning, and is the same, so I am as I am not. So in Heraclitian philosophy, it is exactly this oscillation between opposites that defines and shapes the very nature of things and gives it form. In fact, if you look through the surviving fragments of Heraclitus' work, which is aptly known as The Fragments, you'll see that he paid a lot more attention to the oppositional tendency of flux rather than just being like, everything's in flux, mic drop. These are some of the things he says. The beginning is the end. The road up is the road down. The cosmos works by harmony of tensions like the lyre and bow. And finally, my favorite, many who have learned the countless names of gods and monsters never understand that night and day are one. 
There's no better idea than this to bring in the metaphorical monster fighting, death of God proclaiming, abyss gazing, morality questioning, horse hugging, ice loving, philosophical freak of nature whose work has been misunderstood and misused by everyone across the intellectual and political spectrum, from mad tyrants to angsty schoolboys to existential therapists. I am, of course, talking about Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, as tempting as it is to dedicate the rest of this video to discussing Nietzsche, I'll save that for another time. For now, I'll just talk about Nietzsche's contribution to Jung's conception of enantiodromia. In the opening paragraphs of his book, Human All Too Human, Nietzsche says, Almost all the problems of philosophy once again pose the same form of question as they did 2000 years ago. How can something originate in its opposite? For example, rationality in irrationality, the sentient in the dead, disinterested contemplation in covetous desire, living for others in egoism. What we require is a chemistry of the moral, religious and aesthetic conceptions and sensations, likewise of all the agitations we experience within ourselves in cultural and social intercourse and indeed even when we are alone. What if this chemistry would reveal that in this domain too, the most glorious colors are derived from base, indeed from despised materials? Will there be many who desire to pursue such researches? So what exactly is Nietzsche talking about here? First, he sets up the principle of opposites as an important way to conceptualize reality and the inability to take this principle seriously as a major failing of traditional philosophy, especially metaphysics. Then in the second passage, he's foreshadowing the field of psychology and saying that we may eventually find that our psychological tendencies also follow the principle of opposites, moving between light and dark, sacred and profane. He says we might discover all of this, but for this to happen, there needs to be smart weirdos who are ready and willing to pursue such kinds of research. And this is exactly what Carl Jung was, a super smart weirdo willing to investigate what Nietzsche calls the dangerous perhaps of the strange principles that govern the human mind. Jung was born when Nietzsche was 31 years old and Nietzsche died when Jung was 25 years old. Even though they never met, Jung was influenced by Nietzsche as early as his student years and this interest continued throughout his career. Jung picked up the principle of enantiodromia from Heraclitus and he situated it within the workings of the human mind, building on Nietzsche's project in an incredible way. And in a sense, it was inevitable that both Nietzsche and Jung would be fascinated with the idea that one extreme psychological tendency eventually transmogrifies into its opposite. This is because both Nietzsche and Jung were born into families marked by extreme religiosity. Both their fathers were pastors and deeply involved in their respective churches. Their childhoods were completely soaked in faith-based learning. And they were introduced to biblical theology and morality from the earliest possible age. As they grew older, both Nietzsche and Jung began questioning the religious doctrines they were taught as children. And while their philosophical destinations were different, with Nietzsche turning more iconoclastic and Jung turning more esoteric, they both went very far indeed from the binary divisions of theological good versus evil marked by their childhoods. And they both pushed the understanding of the religious impulse far beyond this binary as well. Jung first discusses enantiodromia in his 1921 work, Psychological Types. To really understand this idea, we have to begin with the basic premise that the human psyche is not composed of only conscious thoughts and intentions. It's a complex, multi-level but ultimately unified system. The consciously expressed part of your personality coexists with repressed desires, unexpressed emotions, unacknowledged weaknesses and hidden fears. And this constitutes the dimension of the personality that Jung calls the shadow. The shadow contains qualities that the individual is unaware of or that are in direct contradiction to their conscious identity, often because these qualities conflict with the societal norms and values the individual has internalized. It's not just made up of negative traits, by the way. The shadow can also include positive aspects that a person may not recognize or value in themselves because of personal or societal reasons. 
when one aspect of your personality becomes so dominant that its shadow opposite aspect is pushed deep into the unconscious this causes a psychic imbalance and at its core an anhedonia is a regulatory mechanism to correct imbalances in psychological systems its concern is always with moving from a state of imbalance to a state of balance but this process is often messy and cyclical with many iterations of moving from one imbalance to another until the psyche moves closer and closer to equilibrium so when a particular conscious attitude is continuously exaggerated and the corresponding unconscious attitude is denied or demonized the balance is disrupted and the denied opposing tendencies start to bubble into everyday life in sneaky disruptive and sometimes even destructive ways jung illustrates this with the case of a man who used to love making art but gives it up and works obsessively to open a printing business he is successful at building his business but in the process he lets the quality of being business like take over his life he stops caring about anything that doesn't fit into his cutthroat profit oriented framework and things like intuition and imagination just sound like airy fairy nonsense to him this goes on for a long time but one day the shadow self he's been unconsciously nurturing comes knocking he feels a strong sudden urge to reconnect with his youthful passion for art but instead of making space for these feelings and making time to pursue them at least as a hobby he impulsively starts giving strange artistic twists to his established products they come across as half baked hurried and awkward His executive decision making starts breaking down driven by the sudden uprush of the childlike spontaneity that's been suppressed in him compensating for the brutal matter of factness with which he banished that side of his nature to the shadows and the result of all this the business slowly starts falling apart his road up becomes his road down as old heraclitus would say Just as an individual life can get caught up in the back and forth of psychological forces beyond its control, so can a group, so can a family, so can a generation, so can a culture, so can an entire history. Throughout his life, Jung became increasingly concerned about the mass effects of anhedonia and its profound collective consequences. Remember how we talked about how your psyche is a self-contained holistic system with a conscious and unconscious side? Well, what if that rabbit hole goes deeper and the unconscious part of your psyche is way bigger than the conscious part? We're still swimming in Freud's waters when we talk about the unconscious in this way, but now imagine all our individual conscious minds as just the tiniest tips of a massive single psychological iceberg called the collective unconscious. Just like your individual psyche, most of this huge interconnected system is unconscious. You are in a sense the conscious nodes of the system. the collective unconscious also has repressed shadow tendencies and you guessed it it also follows the principle of anhedonia the unsettling implication of this idea is that we might be living out intergenerational anhedonia cycles that were kicked off decades before we were born and we might even be caught in historical anhedonia cycles that were initiated thousands and thousands of years ago in fact this very idea that we are currently playing out a specific anhedonia cycle is at the heart of jung's later work especially his book aeon which jordan peterson likes to represent as the psychological equivalent of an eldritch lovecraftian horror that will pulverize unprepared minds and induce nightmares forever Spoiler alert, it's not quite that bad. There are definitely unsettling implications, but if you've been exposed to non-dualistic philosophical and spiritual traditions before, it might just be an idea that you've already come across, which is how the dualistic separation of good versus evil into distinct metaphysical categories can turn into an intellectual, sociological and moral problem. This separation was so absolute in certain Christian societies that only goodness can be seen to exist and evil is even denied the basic respect of being considered truly real. 
the very concept of the self in dualistic cultures becomes preoccupied with cutting off evil from good and not with the more psychologically sustainable pursuit of understanding the reality of evil and accepting that it exists in each and every one of our psyches. This sets up the conditions for a freakishly dense cultural shadow and extreme anachodromian backlash as the mass psychic system struggles to come back to equilibrium. The irony is that the more you deny its reality, the more evil bubbles over from the unconscious and results in very real consequences, whether that's on a small scale or whether that's on the scale of world-threatening reactionary ideologies. And with that context, you might see a bit more sense in old Heraclitus's riddle. Many who have learned the countless names of gods and monsters never understand that night and day are one. Once you begin noticing an anchodromia, you start seeing it everywhere. You see it in history. For example, the secular socialist activist Annie Besant gave up her political views seemingly overnight and became a champion of the occult organization called the Theosophical Society and propped up her young protege Jiddu Krishnamurti as a spiritual messiah. At the time he was supposed to come out to the world as a messiah, Krishnamurti renounced all messiahs and adopted a secular approach to self-awareness and spirituality. Germany was considered to be the apex of civilization in terms of its artistic and philosophical contributions, but it descended into the depths of barbarism with the help of a failed artist named Adolf Hitler, their enanchodromian overcompensations reinforcing each other. You see it everywhere in pop culture. In the movie Joker, Arthur Fleck starts out as an overly agreeable, sensitive and self-conscious comedian who was psychologically turned inside out by trauma into the crown prince of chaos, the Joker, emerging as both a symptom and a cause of Gotham City's turn to violence and rioting. A rioter kills a scared young Bruce Wayne's parents and unwittingly sets in motion the force known as Batman that will bring order to the chaos. In the Dune series, Leto II prevents humanity's extinction by becoming a tyrannical, near-immortal ruler, a god-king. He devises a so-called golden path, which is a vision to ensure humanity's survival. But it requires millennia of oppression and stagnation. Leto leverages the law of Enanchodromia to compress humanity in such an extreme way that when they are finally free, they will scatter across the universe and never again be vulnerable to extinction. You may even see Enanchodromia playing out in your own life. Maybe you're in the middle of a specific Enanchodromia cycle which you're slowly becoming conscious of. Maybe you can see reactions to your parents' personalities that are being played out in your personality. To take a classic example, people-pleasing children tend to have tyrannical fathers. Now, if you've seen my videos before, you'd know that I'm not interested in painting psychological tendencies as universal constants. This is pretty much impossible empirically speaking and many of Jung's ideas cannot be empirically proven. So if you're not inclined to see enanchodromia as a fundamental law or a principle, that's totally fine. You can just think of it, if you wish, as a motif in the narrative of life that helps us make sense of the strange ways in which we act and react. That said, I think people are collectively becoming more aware of this enanchodromia motif. A trend that's become quite popular on social media, especially amongst Gen Z, is entering your villain era. When you inspect this trend closely, it's actually rooted in the sense that overly agreeable and people-pleasing tendencies result in an accumulation of the desire for disagreeableness and boundaries. And entering your villain era is just an acceptance of enanchodromia and allowing this tendency to flow instead of repressing it. The trend also seems to be quite aware of the temporal nature of the shift since it's about willingly entering a phase and not labeling yourself permanently as a villain. Becoming aware of enanchodromia is a really good idea. In fact, according to Jung, it is the only way you stand a chance at getting away from a lifetime of being tossed back and forth between extreme psychological tendencies. Jung says, only he escapes from the cruel law of enanchodromia who knows how to separate himself from the unconscious, not by repressing it, for then it seizes him from behind, 
but by presenting it visibly to himself as something differentiated from him. What Jung means by this is that you need to develop a firm sense of who you are, not by cutting yourself off from your unconscious because that worsens the problem. In fact, if you think you're a completely free agent and you have no unconscious self and you believe it's all up to your free unencumbered will, then you're ironically more likely to be acting out the will of unconscious forces while you remain completely oblivious to them. On the other hand, if you believe that nothing is in your control and act as if everything is already determined, so what's the point? Well, then you're just throwing away the tiny but precious and sublime spark of consciousness you're supposed to be carrying through the sea of the unconscious. In order to not be torn apart by the law of opposites, what you have to do is devote time and effort towards understanding what exactly these massive unconscious forces are acting on. Do you know enough about your own history, thoughts and tendencies to mentally model a relatively accurate version of the entity known as you that is being subjected to the Enantiodromia principle? If you can, then you stand a better chance at riding the waves of Enantiodromia and you may even be able to take a hand in moving towards psychological equilibrium. This process involves deeply honest self-reflection which often requires exploring your most uncomfortable thoughts, emotions and behaviours to understand how the unconscious may be influencing them. This brings shadowy bits and pieces of your personality out of the unconscious and into the light of conscious awareness where it can be acknowledged, understood and integrated healthily and constructively back into your overall psyche. And unlike in many Eastern traditions, this is not about annihilating the ego and leaving it all behind to become a monk. On the contrary, Jung says that the trick is to build a healthy ego by taking responsibility for your everyday life, even as you become increasingly aware of the many aspects of existence that are outside your control. Joseph Campbell gives us a fantastic explanation of this idea. He says, For Jung, ego is the notion of yourself. It defines the center of your consciousness and relates you to the world. It is the I you experience as acting on the world around you. It has nothing to do, however, with the unconscious portion of the self. The ego normally stays above the line of consciousness. Now, suppose you're driving a car, you're on the left side of the road at the wheel. Meanwhile, you're not aware of the other side. In fact, you don't even recognize that you're on one side. You think you're in the middle. Most people drive their lives in this way, according to Jung. They think their ego is who they are. They go driving that way and, of course, the car is knocking people down on the other side of the road. How are you going to enable yourself to see that other side? Do you put another wheel up and have a friend drive you? Do you put a wheel in the middle? No, you have to know what's over there. You have to learn to see three-dimensionally. What Jung says is that you should play your role knowing that you are not the role. This requires individuation, separating your ego, your image of yourself from your social role. Alright, it's hard to beat a Joseph Campbell car metaphor, but I'm going to throw in a little metaphor of my own here. You might be a barnacle on top of a ginormous whale that is the collective unconscious, but that shouldn't stop you from becoming a vital, living and conscious barnacle. Mindfulness, journaling and therapy can all be incredibly useful tools for self-reflection and healing. But this must be accompanied by the conscious decision to take responsibility for your life. Action not only makes you grow, it also deepens your understanding of how you are growing. By choosing to engage with life in all its sorrows and all its joys and combining this with a dedicated process of self-reflection, you differentiate yourself from the amorphous mass of individual and collective desires, feelings and moods that wash over you on a daily basis. You live in the deep knowledge that you are part of an integral whole and you become more and more aware of the system's rhythms. You slowly start becoming a living embodiment of the union of opposites, being spacious enough to hold the contradictions of being composed of both light and dark, conscious and unconscious, everyday and timeless. 
By working towards this combination of daily self-directed action and deep awareness, you are also becoming sensitive to the imbalances that you may be going through and you may find yourself in a better position to take steps to mitigate the imbalances without letting things reach an extreme. You're able to let the enanchodromia come and let it go, but without letting the vital little barnacle of conscious awareness that you are get washed away. And when you become more and more confident through action and awareness, you come to integrate the inferior functions and attitudes so that any enanchodromia becomes a matter of realizing your full potential, not a wreck on the siren's rocks, to borrow again from Joseph Campbell. For example, if you feel like you've become too business-like recently with no patience for the more abstract and subtle aspects of life, then you might want to take some time out every day working on making art with no purpose apart from just expressing your creativity. Even if you think it's childish, it doesn't matter. Be childish. It's okay. You'll be okay if you take a break from yourself. If, for instance, you feel like you have no capability whatsoever to organize things, then you should willingly take on the responsibility of organizing something, maybe for your family and friends, even if it's something small like the itinerary of a upcoming trip. It's going to be painful and they might get annoyed with your inefficiency, but it's only by voluntarily taking on this unfamiliar tendency that you build a relationship with it keep at it, you will get better. And if you feel like being absorbed into an extreme political or religious ideology, I beg you to try to identify the parts of yourself that are crying out for expression and are seeking escape from large-scale mainstream groupthink by running towards validation from small-scale alternative groupthink. You cannot begin the process of coming into awareness when you're too scared to disappoint the undifferentiated mass of opinions that you've idealized as the ultimate good. So here we are, near the end. About time, right? I hope this tour of Anancho Dromia serves as a reminder that life is a dynamic interplay of opposites. It's within this delicate balance that the essence of personal growth and self-discovery lies. As you tread this path, you realize that your journey shouldn't be about suppressing or defeating one aspect of your nature, but about acknowledging and integrating the full spectrum of your being. This integration is a gentle but persistent negotiation between the contrasting forces that live within you. As you engage with these forces, you come to see that each extreme holds a grain of truth, a fragment of your wholeness. The chaos asks for structure, the order points to spontaneity, the shadow reveals light that will guide the way. By consciously participating in this process, you not only mitigate the abrupt swings of enanchodromia, but also cultivate a rich, nuanced sense of self, which is adaptable, resilient and deeply attuned to the subtle harmonies of existence. It's a self that tries to understand the language of the unconscious. As you continue on this path, the light grows brighter, not just for yourself, but for those around you. In embracing the fullness of your being, you're not just navigating the intricate landscape of your psyche, you're also shaping a more conscious, integrated and compassionate field of existence. Thank you so much for watching. Please do consciously smash that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.